We are a counseling training certified center. We do a fall training of the 30 hours. And uh, it's just beyond anything I ever imagined. It was me, tag, you're it, in my basement, <laughs> meeting troubled people and what God has done. Again, I'm not holding a carrot on the stick saying he'll do that with all of you. God is sovereign. So it's not how great I am that he chose to grow us to that size. But I'm just so encouraged. All I wanted to do was help people. And I wanted the local church to be the place they thought they could get help. I thought there, were, there was a big disconnect with you preach a big God on Sunday, you sing big God songs, but when we have real problems on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and we reach out to you, you act like you have no answers. I thought, that isn't good. Let's be the place where on Sunday we sing about a big God, preach a big God, and all through the week, show big God at work through his word and by his spirit with real problems. And it's not perfect, but I'm so encouraged. And, and, and in my mind, I also said, all right, if I ever have staff one day, oh my goodness, I'm gonna make all of them be certified. And uh, so I have. They haven't all said thank you, but I have. <laughs> and uh, so our worship leader is ACBC certified. Our director of operations is ACB. Our admissions director is, but think about this. Do missionaries get their wires crossed? Hello. Do they have marriage problems? They, why should the missions guy have no idea how to do biblical counseling? Does the praise team get snarled up with problems? Yes. I said, let's all do this. Like my worship leader, he, after he was in his 50 hours of, of observation and all that supervision, he came to me and he said, you know what? I didn't like it when you said I needed to do this, but this, he said, this has changed how I put together Sunday morning worship. Because see, he's sitting with real people, with real problems, and helping them, and you realize where people really are. And it's just, it's just great, because I think the way some of those videos were put together, this is what Christians are supposed to be doing. Not just a few people that, oh, happen to be interested in this. This is just intense discipleship. I always say in our church, I wave my Bible around, because the counseling word does scare a lot of people. I just say, wouldn't you like to know how to help a real person with a real problem using your Bible? It should be awkward to say, no, not really. Yes, just like we should all know how to evangelize, we should all know what to do if your next door neighbor says, my son just tried to kill himself this weekend. Well, it's not helpful when you just say, oh, there's my pastor's number, call him. He doesn't know your pastor, he knows you. What if you could sit down and just give hope and encouragement and help? All right, I'll stop. What do you actually wanna know and hear? You can ask whatever. You can ask about biblical counseling. You can ask about idols of the heart. You can ask whatever. I don't care. Yes, ma'am. Well, you were talking about your center, and, and I was just wondering how you reach out to the rural communities in your area. Rural? Rural. Yeah. Where you have a church that has 25 or 100 people in it, and how um, you reach specifically different demographics. Yeah. Mm hmm. I have to be honest. Uh, I've not been thrilled with the receptivity of, of as many churches as I wish, saying, oh, good, show us how to do this. What I've run into, and I've been there 22 years now, is they just want to send us their people. And uh, I hope this doesn't sound bad, but it's like, feed a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. So it might sound mean, but we had to draw a line in the sand because once we were known for doing biblical counseling, I'm happy to counsel an unbeliever. Like I said, I'm meeting with a, a lost couple from my neighborhood right now. I don't want other good Bible teaching churches to just send me all the troubled people. I want them to learn how to do this. So we actually had to say, whoa, 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 whoa. We'll counsel your people if you'll send an elder or deacon or pastor or somebody with them to sit in. And you know what? In most cases, they won't do it. And that is the end of that. But when they do, so there's a church in our area where Warren Wearsby was for 15 years. I don't know if you know that name. Great Bible teacher, wrote a bunch of books. That church, so whenever we get one of them, here's a couple saying, oh, we're the biggest mess. And uh, do you have a church? Oh, yeah, yeah. Does your pastor know? Oh, no. We don't want him to know. Well, see, I don't want to play into that either. Like, he gives an account for their souls, Hebrews 13. He's the one supposed to shepherd them. We shouldn't just throw them over the wall into Grace Fellowship, fix it, throw them back, and that, that leadership never even knows what happened. This is not how it was supposed to work. So, and some of that's just pride. When people say, oh, we don't want anyone at the church to know. Well, I'm not gonna help you with that. 
But this, this church this, did, they sent this godly older man, the executive pastor, and he sat through our counselor meeting with their couple and it had the effect I hoped it would have. He got so excited that fall at our training conference, he brought 15 people from their church and now that church has a biblical counseling ministry. So I saw it work once, but most of them, I mean, we'll go and meet with the pastor and these are good guys that love the Bible and they're just, they're not against it. They just think there's more important things. And I say, you've got people that are hurting. What? Now, I'll be honest, some of these pastors are just so evangelistic. Lead them to the Lord. After that, whatever. Just lead them to the Lord. Reach more lost people. But the people they're reaching are still very broken and they don't seem to have the heart to do anything about it. So I don't know if that answers your question. Re regarding the rural situation, you know, one neat way that uh, counseling is being done is, is through Skype or video, some kind of video conversations. And uh, that's just a, a great way. I actually am do, do one once a week by Skype in a rural, I'm actually the rural person in this case. But uh, it, works, <laughs> it works out real well and you could do that through church and tra train other pastors or other, or even centers that, that will offer that availability as well. Yeah. And, and part of what we do to your question is, oh, we have a heart for other pastors and churches, and so we'll pay for them. So if we get word of any pastor, rural or not, if he'll come, because pastors are so busy, and he'll bring some people, we'll, we'll either pay for half of it or all of it. So I had recently a group that was thanking me, and we paid for all of them, like eight of them, uh, to come to the conference, because we see it as money well spent. There's another pastor and his leaders that are going to take this back to their church Yay. And uh, so we give big scholarships to other pastors and groups to try to help. Because uh, we want to see it take off in other local churches. Yes, ma'am? How would you help a non-believer with their idols? No different. Uh, how would you help an unbeliever with their idols? And so like the couple I'm working right with right now, uh, you know, you want to talk to them about that. But uh, I work at like evangelizing and counseling at the same time. And this couple is not, not resisted. Sometimes you find out in a hurry, if someone is just like, no, I just want you to fix our problem, stop talking about Jesus, and then they quit. Uh, but this couple has really, really responded well. It really is no different. You know, their heart is their heart, and so I keep trying to help them see why do you do what you do, but I keep bringing them back around to, if I just help him become more of the husband you wish he was, and you be the more, and I don't get you both in love with Jesus Christ, you'll never be fully satisfied with each other. So it's not very different, except that I, I probably have to slow down my sessions because I'm spent, I can't cover as much as I would with, with believers, because I'm, I'm teaching basic stuff they don't even understand about gospel and Jesus. Uh, but this has been very encouraging. So much of our time gets spent with them moving it in a spiritual direction. And uh, just like last week, I was so excited. I keep trying to explain grace. She's Catholic and he's nothing. And uh, you, know, you can just see the, mm. and But last week she was so excited and she said, oh, I understand what you're talking about. They have a little girl in parochial Catholic school, and, and she said, uh, call her Sally. Sally came home with a worksheet, and at the top of the worksheet, it said, so how do you get to heaven? And then it said, that's what the Ten Commandments are for. You keep the Ten Commandments. And she said, she leans forward and says, and I thought, that's not right. That's what Pastor Brad's been talking about. That's not, because I had been telling them, the Ten Commandments were given to show us how far short we fall. You could never keep the Ten Commandments. Jesus did, and he died for us, and you're saved by grace. So I was encouraged that she's... So I'm, in a sense, covering gospel basics and giving them marriage homework. But like the way I'm addressing gospel is I'm always getting my counselors to read the Bible. Well, with them, they don't know the Bible. So like we had three weeks where we weren't meeting because I was in Knoxville and they were traveling. It was holidays. Well, in three weeks, you can read the Gospel of John. There's 21 chapters. I said, read one chapter of John a day. And I want, I've got this little thing by Jim Eliff. I don't know if you know that name. He's got a, a ministry called Christian, Christian Counselors World, Christian uh, CCW or something. All his stuff is free, and it's great. He's got a little brochure called The Unrepenting Repenter that is gold. And he's got this little brochure called 21 Days with God. 
where you just basically would read one chapter of the, of the Gospel of John, and it's just like, what stood out to you the most? What's a question that you have? What was your favorite verse? And that's what I had them do, because I want them to see Jesus. No better way than to read the gospel. But at the same time, I assigned some marriage kind of homework, but I had them reading Gospel of John, a chapter each day. It's Jim Elif, E-L-I-F-F. I wish I could remember what his ministry really is, but he, he got excited about uh, George Mueller of Bristol who ran those orphanages without asking for any money, so he won't take any money. All his stuff is free. You have to send him money at a different time. Every time I send him money with my order, he sends the check back with all the stuff I wanted. And, uh, but he's got really good stuff. I use a lot of his stuff. Somebody else? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, there is, but you know what? The guidance we have to go with is just make sure. I assume you're assuming you started with you already, because Matthew five says, "Get the log out of your own eye, so that you can see." And here's what I think is interesting: that passage gets misused a lot, especially by unbelievers. Judge not, lest you be judged. The passage was never intended to convey we can never speak into each other's lives. Just mind your own business. What it really says is deal with your own stuff first so that you can even see clearly because then it says then you can see clearly to talk about your brother or sister so there is a place but here's how I always tell, tell it to people go asking questions not making accusations go asking questions it's fine but start at hey could you help me understand better it appears as we've worked through this I hear you saying it looks like so that's not manipulation, that's biblical. You assume the best, love thinks no evil, and so you go asking questions, and, and often as you ask questions, you can help someone to see. Sometimes you have to come right out and say, no, look, dude, this is you, it's, it, it's, it's evil, it's you. But you don't start there. And, uh... mm -hmm. Yes, sir, Nick? Uh, this may just be my own subjective, but I think I've been righteously angry uh, twice <laughs> in my life. We're so quick to assume this is righteous indignation, and I'm telling you what, almost always, if I get quiet and alone with the Lord, there's more of me tied up in that than I would like to believe. But don't hear me saying there's not a place for it, because obviously Ephesians 4 says, be angry and do not sin. So it's, it's, well, for instance, to me, righteous indignation is the, the sense that I still have that I don't want to lose, that abortion is murdering babies, uh, sex trade, abuse, you know what I mean? Within me, created in the image of God, and I'm his image bearer, and he's a just God, and he created people to be loved, not abused. I don't want to lose that. I don't want to become numb. It happens so much. You know, the other day we reached out to another local church pastor because there was a bad thing that was going on with this man and our church, and he just left our church and went to another church. It happens all the time. They just leave and go to another church. He's over there involved in ministry already in good standing. So it's like we call and we're like, hey, 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 this is what's going on. And the pastor said to us, ah, that kind of stuff just happens. It just happens today. Well, yeah, I know it happens, but let's, let's do what we can. You're a pastor, you're, and he just wouldn't do anything. So that man was just accepted into leadership and married another woman in their church. And So I don't know if that answered your question. Yes, it's possible. I don't think, if you're asking, I don't think I've ever had righteous anger about bikes in the driveway, righteous anger that my wife hasn't put all the laundry away, righteous anger that she can't find her keys. I'm not sure how you'd tie that to the glory of God, you know. It's, it's got to be because our God is being belittled. Oh, I want his name to be great. 
Oh, I long to see as the oceans cover the earth the glory of the Lord, that he'd be seen for who he is. That's righteous anger. But most of our everyday interactions, when I just roar, it's me. You just crossed me and the rules of my kingdom, usually. But that may just be me, Nick. You may be much more like Jesus. <laughs> Ask your wife what she thinks. <laughs> Somebody else? That's a good question. A good resource on anger. Uh, sure. What's a good resource on anger? I tell you what, related to you and your children, I haven't found anything better yet than Lou Priolo's The Heart of Anger. The first two chapters are gold. 25 ways you might be provoking your children to anger. So whenever we have kids out of control, we don't just jump in with, oh, what is wrong with this kid? We start with the parents, and we don't look at them and say, let's figure out how this is your fault. That's not what I mean. But they're shepherding these kids, and it is really good. So related to parent-child unrest and anger, Lupriolo, the heart of anger. Uh, for us, there's a number of good ones now. The, the good news is that today in the biblical counseling world, man, books are being published. So Ed Welch has a brand new one about anger that is really, anybody know the title? You're nodding, Dave. 50 Days to Peace and Tranquility or something. Huh? Well, uprooting anger is, is uh, I thought that was uh, Wayne Mack. Pallison has one. There's a number of them. There's, you, and, and none of them would be like, oh, that's a dud. There's a number of good biblical counseling books uh, related to anger. I tell you, the last chapter I read about anger that I thought was just so good, it's not a book about anger, but it was um, The Seven Deadly Sins, and it was, the editor was Marshall Siegel. It was a Desiring God Ministries book. One, each chapter is a different. The chapter, I can't even remember the guy who wrote it, the chapter in there on anger was so insightful. I was in the middle of working with a couple, and anger was his deal, so I signed him just that chapter. He told me that changed his life. I thought it was really good, and, but that encouraged me. It's like, ooh, that is an insightful chapter on anger. So it's a yellow paperback book. Yes? Can you spell the name of the author, Heart of Anger? The Heart of Anger by Lou Priolo, P-R-I-O-L-O. -O. And for what it's worth, while we're talking about Lou Priolo, I know there's a lot of good marriage books. My top favorite husband book is his book, The Complete husband. I mean, it's in your face. I mean, it's a punch in the nose, but it is really good. We use it with our men's groups. It is really, really good. The Complete Husband by Lou Priolo, Heart of Anger by Lou Priolo. He's got a lot of books. The Ed Welch book is a small book. Yes. A big problem. Yes. It, anger. So Ed Welch's new book on anger, a small book about a big problem. Really, really good. Somebody else? I think, it, I think it's just The Seven Deadly Sins and Marshall Siegel. I think it's S-E-A-G-A-L-L, -L, maybe two L's. And the, and the publication is Desiring God Ministries. It is a great day for books, you guys. Whew. If you'd been with us two decades ago, we, we had like six little pamphlets by Jay Adams, and that was about it. I kid you not. And boom. People are writing, and oh, it's so helpful. And if you're new on the front end of this, for what it's worth, unless you just love reading, and I do, but most people don't, and if they're in a trial and they're hurting, they're not likely to be in the mood for reading a 180, 200-page book. The good news is there are excellent booklets for Christianettes with trialettes. No, there's... <laughs> But, it, but it's nice, you know, 26 pages, 28 pages. And I mean, I kid you not, there's something left-handed, red-headed into ceramics, and I'm depressed. There's a specific <laughs> booklet for everything. I mean, the other day I walked through our resource center because we try to keep them all, and I, someone had recently committed suicide, and there was one, there was one written that's to, for someone who's thinking about committing suicide. There's one for those left behind after they've committed. There's just great Resource. New Growth Press. New Growth Press is the publisher that just has 
all tons of booklets, Christian, Christian counseling booklets. And so I most often am using a booklet or a chapter from a book with someone. I don't, I almost never assign a book. Yes, sir. Oh, my favorite book about church and life together and let's love each other and stop is, is uh, Life Together by Bonhoeffer. And it's sure, I've read that four times. It is so good. I was disillusioned as a young youth music guy with hair, crying in my senior pastor's office, saying, I don't, I don't think I'm a gifted for ministry. I can't do this. I just can't do this. And, and he was a really kind, wise guy. He said, Brad, you need to memorize 2 Corinthians 3, 4, and 5, and I did, and it's excellent. Not that we're sufficient to think of anything as coming from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who's made us sufficient as uh, uh, something of the new covenant. Not a letter, but of the, of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Oh, it was just so life-giving to memorize those three chapters, and then he said, Read Bonhoeffer's life together because he shatters this whole notion of, but why in the church? And I didn't expect to get hurt and other people are, oh, ooh, ooh. really, really good. Life together. Brad, could you describe how you give homework out of a book? How I give homework out of a book? When I said I do use a book, but if I do. Yeah, or a chapter. Okay. Well, not that complicated, Pete. I just say, read that chapter. And so like in my book, there's a whole chapter on how it wreaks havoc on your relationships. So as I'm, if that is the issue, say it's a mother, mother-in-law, whatever. What, like I've got a whole chapter on false identity. So when you know, I've touched on it as I've talked, but it's a deal where someone doesn't recognize they've allowed their whole career and work has become their identity or mother has, then I can give them more to think about. I'll say read chapter. But when I do it, Pete, if this is what you mean, I'll say read chapter 12 and I want you to underline the top five sentences that stand out to you. Now, here's why I do this. I've learned, if you say, hey, read chapter 12, and you get together, and you say, so, and they're like, yeah. You read it, mm-hmm. What'd you think? Yeah. Okay, what are we gonna do now? So I wanna get going, and I can say, what's the first thing you underlined? Well, because I said, you can underline it because you don't like it, you don't understand it. You're like, yes. And now we've got a conversation going. So whenever I sign a chapter, even when I sign booklets, I'll always say, read this booklet and underline the top five things. And I always say, it's not a trick question. There's not five things I'm hoping you'll see. And you try to guess what Brad is thinking. No, I want just, it stood out to you. Because then when they say it, I'm doing this right now with, with my counselees, and I'll say, so why did you underline that? And when they start talking, you start learning. You start learning. You're hearing more of them. It's very helpful. Is that what you meant? Yes, sir? Brad, I'm uh, starting to meet with a counselor who is suffering from chronic pain. Mm. That's the first for me. What would that look like? We've sat together. We've wept together. We've uh, just tried to get as much information about that situation as we can. Yeah. It's not about a loss, but where to begin. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and it, we're seeing more of this. You know, there's just a lot of things now. I have many people in my church that hurt, and I don't think they're making this up. And there's just no, there's no label for it. There's no. And so what it boils down to is, and my. My final message we're gonna to get to, we'll touch on this a little bit. What do you do and how, do you, how would you encourage someone when there is no fix? There's no fix. Like it or not, we tend to head into counseling and if there is, praise God, like our marriage really did get better when we met with Stuart Scott and saw Idols of the Heart. But you'll get cases and there's instances where this is not likely to feel any better. So what are we doing? Well, you're not wasting your time. Is In essence, I, 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 in those cases, I feel like I'm walking with a sufferer, and I want to walk with them, and I want to help them to understand how, A, frame it up 
So you're gonna try to frame up their suffering in light of eternity and not just right here, right now. They gotta have the bigger picture. And then you basically end up just helping them persevere. So it's not just that, they live in pain. What about someone who has a horrific marriage and their spouse isn't interested in getting help but they, there's no grounds for biblical divorce? They're gonna have to, I have people quit all the time and I've got half a marriage. What do I do with this other person? There's not a lot of hope that, the, that we're gonna see reconciliation because half of it just stopped coming. What are we doing? We're helping this person know how to persevere. So I'll tell you one of my favorite books uh, that I use in those instances and, uh, and when I've used it, I get such good feedback. Down But Not Out by Wayne Mack. Down But Not, and it is about, oh. And he takes some of my favorite passages like 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18. Uh, Even though the outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us. We feel like it's against us. God's word says it's working for us a far more eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary. The things which are not seen are eternal. You just end up having to encourage big picture, perseverance. And a lot, you know, sometimes one of the best gifts you give a sufferer is to allow them to tell their story and just have a safe place that they can have someone to talk to. You're not, you're not wasting your time to just listen to them. And Praise God, I stumbled into that. Okay. I did not think that that first meeting was the time to start talking about our story. Yeah. We may get there, but yeah. it's more like let me sit and breathe with you. Yes. He made that comment. Good. Thank you for listening. Good. Right. Yeah. Right. Yep. But the truths that you have that could be very helpful to him, here's what I find. Too often, biblical counselors are too quick to start telling some of those things. That sufferer, what that says, you haven't even heard me. We, here's what's interesting. After you hear them, I hope this doesn't sound bad. You're probably still gonna say what you were gonna say. But the danger is, if you fall into the trap of thinking, let me just cut to the chase. I don't need to take three sessions to listen to all this. I'm gonna say what I'm about. Oh, no, 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 no. It's a gift that you're giving them. Like, I I appreciate how David, one one of his things he pointed out is, Jesus listened. Jesus didn't cut him off. And so we live in a fast-paced world, a selfish world, a harsh world. You might be the first person that's truly listened. And uh, then you might have the opportunity to give a helpful insight about identity or, or something else. No doubt there's some things that could be reoriented that would be helpful, but not before you've listened well. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, yeah. Any, any number of, you know, sometimes, like to me, apathy... You know, I don't need, know if you mean by that, just whatever, and not, but sometimes that and procrastination, actually what's at the heart of that is perfectionism. And so the fact that I only want to do things perfectly causes me to never do anything. And so here's where you miss it. If you jump in with guns blaring and start throwing around laziness versus this person's not lazy. They're a perfectionist. That's why they don't get going on things because they're so afraid they won't do it perfectly. So that's why you ask questions. Always ask questions before you jump in on any issue. It's the difference between the presenting issue. So the presenting issue looks like apathy. Well, why? Why are they so? So asking good questions and listening and I have to write things down and I'll go back over my notes. Well, I'll be three, four weeks into it and I'll just reread it all and say, is there a theme I'm missing? Is there something I haven't picked up on that I should? And I'll come back around and ask some more questions. So some good scripture um, that you always say is Isaiah 
Uh, I know there are some. They're not jumping into my mind right now, but the best book, because she's a woman who has struggled with it, and it's a struggle that's out there, is Amy Baker, Dr. Amy Baker. It's as simple as it sounds, B-A-K-E-R. And uh, the title of the book is Picture Perfect. And she does lectures at Lafayette where I take our people for training on perfect, and she is, she's thought about it. She's worked her way through it biblically, and she's very biblical. It's excellent. Picture Perfect by Dr. Amy Baker. Dave. And I'm sorry if I, my face looks the way it does. I'm deaf in one ear, so I'm working real hard to hear you. And I look at mouths a lot. Are you asking, as a biblical counselor, you're likely to get involved in lots of things? How do you make sure that you're yeah, care, taking care of yourself? Boundaries, yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Are you talking about how do you debrief and do those things without violating confidentiality? Okay, okay. Here's one thing that I tell our counselors, and it might sound harsh at first. And typically I find that it's more, it happens more with our female counselors than male. I'll tell them, your phone is a service to you. You do not have to answer it every time it rings. You don't have to respond to every text. Technology is is a blessing and it's a curse. So when you start counseling, ladies especially, they can just blow it up. I mean just... They're texting you throughout the day, and they're calling, and it's interrupt. I've had more female counselors' husbands come to me and say, that's it. She's done. No more. He lost his wife. Every meal is interrupted with a phone call. Every, oh, no, 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 no. And here's, uh, Dave touched on it in his talk. You don't want to become the wonderful counselor. You're pointing them to the wonderful, and here's what I've learned. It's harder for ladies. If you don't answer right then, they just might do what they should have done. <laughs> Cry out to Jesus. So you don't want it to be like, they're like, oh my goodness, I love Sally. I just need her the rest of my life. She's always been there for me. She helps me work through everything, and I was just really discouraged right now, and I got confused, and she calls again, she texts again. If you do that, you will create a bond with you and them. My goal is to lead them to the wonderful counselor by not always being available. You actually accomplish that better. Hope that doesn't sound terrible, but if you can be available immediately all the time, you're actually not probably doing what you need to do with them. I don't know if that helps. Any... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, how I let go of it is that's the other reason I pray and fast. I don't know what everybody else is doing, but I would just, I can't carry all this. So I get with the Lord and I unload it. I cast my burdens on him. I cry out. I'll never forget this one prayer day. I'd already had it scheduled, but I had a horrific counseling case, and she's in bed, and she's on seven meds, and she hadn't gotten up, and she hasn't bathed for two weeks. It's just awful. And small group ladies have gone over there and she rebukes them and she won't talk to anybody and just, you know, this, we need God to work. And I just fell on my knees and I cried out for them with my Bible open. I just prayed for them. And I said, oh God, get her. Oh God, help her do what we, for like two and a half hours. And uh, when I got to church on Sunday, 
in between two of the services, I saw her in the aisle. I'm like, oh my goodness, there she is. Bay, I, she didn't smell bad. I was like, I guess she got up, showered, and, and then she comes towards me. She said, oh, Pastor Brad, I need to meet with you this week. It won't take long. I was like, oh, that's not good. Usually when anyone says that, that's just, we're done. I'm divorcing him, uh, that's it. So I went home after church and I got on my knees in the bedroom and I prayed some more. Oh, God of the heavens, get her, help her. And when she came in, she said, now I, I don't have another story like this, so I, w- I want to be careful. I'm telling you my best story. So I don't want you to think, oh, wow, that must happen all the time for Pastor Brad once. <laughs> and she says, on Thursday, that's when I was crying out to God at the prayer day. She said, on Thursday, I was just lying there and I, my dad's an alcoholic, my brother's a drug addict, and they always said they just did it to check out on life. And she said, I thought that would be great. But she said, I just felt like I was in this black pit, and all of a sudden, I just thought, I don't want to do this. I don't want, I'm over there crying out to God. And she said, I got up, and she's sitting here, and she's like, I want to forgive him. I want to forgive. And they're still together. I see them when I'm preaching. So encouraging. So I don't know how I got on that. Oh, oh, I pray. I cast my burdens on the Lord. So there's times like I don't know what else to do. I don't have a worksheet for we don't bathe. Yeah. That's a good, good question. Here's how I would word it. I believe this whole issue of idols of the heart is similar to addressing pride. I would never say, well, we need to kill pride. And we did that in 2018. <laughs> now let's work on our end times chart. No, to me it's like, I want to be killing pride and be cultivating humility for a lifetime by inviting people to easily speak to me. So with idolatry, it's the same way. It's like, you heard me at one point say, I've identified my top, and not that there couldn't be a new one, that would, but it hadn't yet. I mean, the ones that were mine, they're mine. And so I just wanna stay vigilant before the Lord of constantly being aware. They're all written in my prayer journal, all five. And I've got different days I pray for our marriage and different ways on my own heart. And then I get away, as I said, like six times a year for a day of prayer. But in December, I always always take with me this article I found in Leadership Journal by um, Fred Smith that, that actually was the guy that formed FedEx. Fred Smith called Conducting a Spiritual Audit. It's excellent. It's excellent. And I just work my way through that. So, but privately, honestly, privately is probably not the best only. Then just make it easy for your spouse to say things to you. Make it easy for your leadership team. Make it easy for good friends. And there's never a surefire. So it's never like, I know I'm living right now free and clear. My heart is perfect. No. But to the best of my knowledge, I'm not right now guarding and hiding something and promoting it and feeding it. If that's, I think you want me to. Stop, right? Yes. Good. Good questions.